we're here to relate our experiences after being deployed to Hancock County, Mississippi, uh, right after Hurricane Katrina, which I'm sure most of you remember. Um, we were deployed by the state of Florida, the EOC, or what they call the state warning point. We had, we were at that time living in our motorhome in Claremont, Florida, which is in Lake County and just west of Orlando. And I had been monitoring the uh, North Carolina phone net on 3950 every evening. And there had been a discussion since uh, Katrina hit about deploying Florida ham resources to Mississippi. Governor Jeb Bush and the governor of Mississippi had a mutual agreement where one would help the other in, in a time of crisis. And so the state of Florida was in the process of deploying many, many assets to Mississippi to help with the process. Uh, we were the third team to be deployed. What the state wanted or what, what the section emergency coordinator who then was Joe Bushel, W2DWR, he was living and still lives in Live Oak, Florida. Of course, he was working with the section manager who at that time was Rudy Hubbard, WA4PUP of Milton. So in their discussions, they uh, decided to send teams of four people over and they wanted the teams to be active for four days with a day overlap between each team. So the first team that went over was uh, from the uh, Hillsborough County, Tampa Bay area. The second team that went over was from the uh, Tallahassee area. And we were the third area, to go, the third team to go over. We were joined by uh, two hams from Jackson County. Rick Addington, I'm not sure that's his correct name. He was the EC in Jackson County. And one of his assistant ECs, Bill uh, Everett. So when we arrived at the state EOC, which is where we were directed to go, we received uh, passes, if you will. I'll show that to you in just a second. This is a slide that depicts the, uh, the path of Hurricane Katrina. And it may be a little bit difficult for you to see, but the black line shows the, the path and if you can make it out, it, uh, it hits the state exactly between Alabama and Mississippi, right on the state line. And you all know where the worst uh, effect of a hurricane is in the northeast quadrant. So if you look at that slide, the northeast quadrant is Mississippi. The so farthest west county in Mississippi is Jackson County. And that's where we went. Uh, we got a letter from the state warning officer that allowed us passage all the way to uh, Mississippi. We were directed to go to the Stennis uh, Spaceport or Space Center there in Mississippi. Uh, we also were given a, uh, a placard, if you will, to put in a windshield of our motorhome. Incidentally, our motorhome was radioactive. We had HF two meter, 440 and 220 capabilities in the motorhome. So we left uh, the state warning point sometime around noon. They directed us to the Tallahassee uh, ca uh, fairgrounds where we were given several cases of water that we were to use there. They told us to stop here in Milton and to go to the state DOT uh, office right off of Avalon Boulevard and Highway 90. And they filled us up with gas. And when your motor home is only getting six to seven miles per gallon, that's, that's pretty good. Where'd you get free gasoline? So off we went. Uh, the directions were to stop at the rest area at mile marker three. So just before the state line, and I'm not getting a, a click here. Um, between Governor Bush and the Governor of Mississippi, they set up a convoy uh, escorted by Florida State Highway Patrol officer every evening that left this uh, rest area about 7 p.m. The reason for that, that I heard, I can't confirm this, 
but that some of the trucks going from Florida to Mississippi had been hijacked by folks in Alabama, I guess. So anyway, at, better say waylaid, better say waylaid okay. <laughs> For some reason, they decided that we would lead the convoy and Ricky and Bill were in the pickup truck pulling their travel trailer right behind them. And we had about 30, 35 trailers, trucks, big rigs. Next slide, please. That were gonna follow us. And can't see it very well, but they're all lined up there in the rest area. So off we went, next slide, please. We followed the highway patrol with his disco lights going. And we wore sun, Daisy and I wore sunglasses all the way because those lights get pretty damn bright when they pop off, you know. And it was kind of funny because we'd be going along and these, you know, the, the convoy wasn't going the speed limit of 70 miles an hour. We were alternating between 45 and 65, you know, like a rubber band effect. <clears throat> and we had some 18 wheelers that come roaring by us in the left lane, you know, until they got to the front and they saw those disco lights going, woo! all of a sudden they come to a halt. And of course on the CB, you hear all the talk about the, the uh, highway patrol in front of this convoy. And then when they got up closer, they said, oh, it's Florida Highway Patrol, we don't worry about him. So they went rolling down the road. So anyway, there we went, uh, three and a half hours or so. We got to Mississippi sometime around uh, between 11 and midnight or so. Next slide. Uh, that's what the uh, main building at Stennis looked like. We couldn't find anybody to talk to that knew what we were doing. So we ended up parking beside the road. And we got up the next morning and we found, next slide, where they were given a briefing. And this is the Florida CERT team, State Emergency Re Response Team. And nobody talked about radio communications or ham radio in this particular slide. So I finally found someone whom I thought was in charge and asked him about the ESF2 poncho. You remember ESF2, falls, it, the communications falls under ESF2. And ham radio obviously falls under communications. So after checking with a few people, he finally decided that, that uh, Randy, Randy Pierce from the state of Florida, his call is AG4UU, Alpha Golf 4 Uniform Uniform. Randy works in the uh, Department of Transportation for the state, and he's one of the guys, incidentally, that is responsible for the, CERT, uh, the SAR repeater system, the statewide amateur radio UHF network that runs from Key West all the way over here, or actually over to Pensacola, although their repeater hadn't gone up yet, but the one in Milton covers uh, Scambia County. Okay, next slide. So from there, we. Oh, by the way, he said that Randy was over at the Stennis International Airport, and that's where we were supposed to go. So there we went. But before that, they said, come on in here and have breakfast. So the state of Florida had set up a, a restaurant, if you will. So we went in there and had a free breakfast. Next slide, please. One of the one of the perks. Well, that's the uh, the main uh, control point for the Florida CERT. Again, it's S E R T, not C E R T. We went in there and were amazed with all of the technology that they had. They were receiving satellite pictures of what was going on, et cetera, et cetera, and they were printing out maps that were like three feet wide, and you know they had a humongous printer in there. Okay, next slide, please. So off we went to, uh, oh, okay. If you look at this slide now, what you see uh, uh, in blue is where the, the, uh, the water reached over land. So on the right is uh, Jackson County. In the middle is part of Hancock County. And I'll show you, uh, I'm sorry, is uh, where Biloxi is. What county is that? Harrison, Harrison County, sorry. And Jackson County is the one on the left. And you can see that that uh, storm surge reached pretty far up in the state of Mississippi. One more slide, please. Okay, that's uh, Hancock County. You can barely see it, but there's a red X there. And that's where the state, uh, I'm sorry, Stennis International Airport is. But initially we were, as I told you, we landed at the Stennis Space Center, 
So we had to get back over, which is coming back east on I-10. Right, the dark road right through the middle is I-10. So we started, well, before we started back at the uh, Dennis Space Center, we were told to go to the local gas station inside the Space Center. Next slide. And again, we got uh, a whole bunch of gallons of free gas after waiting a line, of course, because everybody that had a, the, the proper authorization was given uh, gasoline. And that big placard in the windshield there afforded us the free gasoline. So after filling up, we made our way back and got on I-10. Next slide. When we got to uh, Highway 603 and turned north, uh, that's the highway that was going to take us to the International Airport. If you can see that somewhat dark line that kind of extends to the right below the bridge there, that's the water line. That's how high the surge came, at least right at that particular location. So it wasn't anything to fool with. We heard, again, I can't confirm, we heard that the surge in some places was 30 feet high. We also heard that there were two police on duty in the Waveland police station when the surge came through and they ended up swimming out of the police station. Now, Waveland is the town that's right on the Gulf and that's close to where we were stationed. Next slide, please. So we got to the Stennis International Airport. Next slide. And I asked them where, to, where I could park my motorhome and they said, well, any way you want. And I chose this particular location right here. If you notice at the top left corner there of the motorhome, I have a dual band J-pole set up and it's pretty hard to see, but on the right side of the motorhome, I had a 15 foot, foot push up pole and I had a 80 meter dipole made out of two ham sticks, 75 meter ham sticks. I tried to get in touch with the uh, Florida EOC people, and it turned out that building that you see right on the left had a metal roof. So my antennas being so close, it didn't work too well, to say the least. Later on in our uh, time there, I moved the motor home, and I didn't need the 80 meters because one of the folks that came after us uh, strung an 80 meter dipole up in the trees, and he was in the clear, and he could talk, he could talk to the state people uh, quite a bit better than I could. So we set up the motorhome and we got out. Next slide, please. The gentleman that you see on the left there is Ricky Addington from Jackson County. And on the right is the gentleman from uh, Tallahassee and I can't remember his name. There's a building in the background there and that's the uh, main building for the Hancock County um, school where they taught uh, auto mechanics and vocational school. And uh, when we got there, they were in the process of stringing an 80 meter dipole on top of the building. Next slide, please. You can see all of the cars and people milling around. I mean, Hillsborough County, Tampa, they must have had 75% of their sheriff's department there. They had a kitchen set up. I mean, all over it, fire departments from all over the state of Florida, different counties, different cities. Yeah. It had folks from Hawaii. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, again, not too long after we got there, they uh, started setting up a system deployed again by the state of Florida called EDIX, Echo Delta India Charlie Sierra. Emergency Deployable Incident Communication System. Okay, now you see it's got a telescoping pole there. You can't really see that. You'll see it in a minute. Every one, every one of those uh, round pedals, if you will, has an antenna on it on the top and on the bottom. So we kept erecting that. Next slide, please. Again, push up poles that had guy wires at three different points. Next slide. It'll, it'll keep going up. And Right there, I think it, well, there's one more slide, I think where it gets to its, its uh, complete height. They had two of those that they erected. And you see the trailer there in back of that walkway, that trailer housed the computers that control that, all of those uh, antennas, which they said they could communicate daylight till dark on. So somebody could talk in on a CB and, and it would put out 
uh, communication on 800 megahertz for the law enforcement or public service. Now, I didn't see that in action, so I don't know how good it worked. We were told that they had one of those systems in each of the counties in the state. I'm not sure that was correct, but maybe each of the major divisions of the state of Florida. But at the time, it was kind of a gee whiz thing for us to look at because uh, we had never seen anything like that. Okay, next slide. All right, because they had the HF antenna installed upstairs, they had some radio equipment here. We had uh, HF, we had a 47 meg, well not 47, whatever the Red Cross uses, 43 meg, somewhere in that 40 megahertz vicinity. And they had uh, two meter capability. Uh, we had uh, 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 a ham at one of the shelters in downtown Waveland. We tried to reach him on, on the uh, Red Cross frequency and couldn't talk to him. They ended up deploying some of those radios to each of the shelters and we couldn't talk to him on those radios for whatever reason. So one of the hams from Tallahassee drove his vehicle uh, five or six miles away from this particular location. And we were able to relay through him to the pod area where they were distributing food and uh, MREs and water and, and so on. Uh, and he stuck up a 10 foot pole with a J pole on it and used his car radio and was able to communicate back here. <clears throat> The reason he, we could communicate was because the, the uh, repeater in uh, Hancock County got destroyed when the 30 foot surge came through. You know, the, the shack with the actual radio in it uh, got flooded out, so it wasn't working anymore. Uh, eventually, uh, Randy Pierce, the a, a, AG4UU, the ESF2 director, had a brand new Motorola repeater uh brought in and we put the the two meter repeater in waveland back online uh, so at that point we had a repeater in biloxi and we had a repeater in waveland now the repeater in jackson they didn't have a repeater in jackson county so we had two reader two repeaters operational go ahead please next slide bolivar county which is in the northern part of the state of mississippi sent their communications van and that's where communications originated from to sheriff's office, fire departments, police departments, Mississippi State Highway Patrol, Mississippi State Emergency Management, et cetera. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see some of the equipment in there, uh, 800 megahertz radios, uh, the couple of uh, computers, of course. One of the computers on the left there was a Red Cross uh, website trying to keep track of missing people or found people. Um, next slide, show you a bit more. Um, oh, uh, what we've gotten used to in COVID, right, is the is the things to uh, search. Uh, Germex, yeah. And anywhere you went around the facility and around the campus there, there were bottles of Germex that everybody had to use. Next slide. This is uh, one of the professional dispatchers from Bolivar County. And she had been there from the time that they had brought the bus down until we got there. When we got there, she said, I'm done, and she left. So Randy Pierce grabbed Daisy, hauled her into the bus and said, there you are. She said, I can't work all these different radios. He said, you know how to use a push to talk? She said, yeah, he said, you got it, and he left. <laughs> So tell them the first thing that happened. Oh, well, it had a fire. The sheriff's department called it a fire. Well, I had the thing to tune out a fire department, but I didn't know who was who. So I just got on the radio and told them where the address was, and I said, "Who's coming?" And somebody responded back, "We're going to we're going to do it." I said, "Let me know when you get on scene." And then they called back, said they were on scene, and that's the way we handled it. Okay, can you back that picture back up a little bit? I want to show something. Well, next picture. We'll maybe see it on the next picture. Okay, there's Daisy at work. Again, it's a little bit hard to see, but hanging from the roof there is a rubber antenna about 10 inches long. And that wire goes down to the desktop. And on the desktop is a fine looking ICOM 
IC 706 Mark II G. But there was no an external antenna that would allow you to use HF on the bus or any capability of using it on the bus. So Daisy was relegated, obviously, to the radios there, the 800 radios for dispatching different activities, uh, low band radio for the local fire departments. Uh, Okay, next slide, please. I'm sitting in my air conditioned motorhome, so I'm not, not too uncomfortable. And I have my laptop there, so I, every, uh, and, a, and a pad and pencil, of course. Everything that occurred that I did, I wrote down on the pad. Every night, I would get on the laptop and I would type up everything I had done to make a computerized record of it. On top of the TV, there is the dual band radio and the, uh, 220 radio, which we didn't use, of course. So at that particular time, we had the repeater working in, in Hancock County. We had the, the uh, EOC folks inside the building there. We had Daisy in the bus, and I was in the motorhome, and I ended up liaisoning between Jackson County, uh, Harrison County, and Hancock County whatever traffic had to go in but back and forth between any of the three counties, and I've got some examples here. We, uh, we talked about, we talked with, there was a ham that was stationed with Ameri American Medical Response, AMR, and we asked him to dispatch uh, a sheriff to a, a assault location and gave the address, okay? Uh, Harrison County wanted the sheriff's office dispatched to a flu family dispute. They had a request for blue tarp dis distribution. Uh, AMR called in a hazmat spell. These are just examples. Uh, Jackson County wanted info for parolees of all things. Where do they go? Uh, we advised Harrison County of the availability of satellite phones uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, again, that's the lash up. I was in the uh, motorhome coordinating the three counties. Daisy was in the bus, and her role was whatever, whatever she received a request from the EOC, which now could talk to the pods. Pods is where the point of distribution for the water and MREs and ice. Her, her job, her task, once receiving uh, a request from me or from a pod, she would take it into the inside, which is where the e makeshift EOC for the county was set up. And I've got a picture of that in just a minute. Next slide, please. Whoops. I think the next slide is a picture of the uh, forest service unloading trucks that have all of the supplies, the MREs, water and ice. The next picture is a picture of the actual pod where they distributed the locations. We eventually got a ham in each pod and that's how they could communicate back to the REOC about what their needs were. And the Forest Service, as Daisy mentioned, they were responsible for unloading the trucks and getting the material to the pods, the various pods. Next slide. Okay, this is the makeshift EOC that was set up there in that same building. We were all in there together. So everybody was in here. All of the ESFs were in there. If you're familiar with the emergency support functions that function under the NIMS, the National Incident Management System, uh, the, the fellow in the red shirt, kind of in the back right side, that's that's Hootie. He's the real-life emergency manager for Hancock County. 
he told us at some point during our stay there that virtually all of his staff hightailed it out of out of Hancock County when the hurricane came. So he was relying on people from basically from Hillsborough County that performed these duties in Hillsborough and were taking on the duties there at at uh, in Hancock County. So you know the the, the regular uh, ESF function, security and housing and people kinds of things. Uh, I don't know what all, what else, but there's what, 14 EFF, something like that. Okay, next slide. We had a, we hams had a meeting every evening at nine o'clock. We, Daisy and I worked from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day, 12 hours. And uh, things kind of slowed down at night. Yeah, with the white hair and the blue shirt there in the back, that's Randy Pierce. The, ESF2 guru on station. And um, I don't see you or I, but anyway, all of us that were working at that particular time were in the room and we were all sharing what we accomplished or failed to accomplish that day. And one of Randy's uh, things to do is you, everybody's got to tell a joke, meaning we had to find something funny out of everything we did that day and report it, had to end on a high note. So we had a report of what was in the pool, a whale? No. <laughs> it ended up being a seal. Yeah, but somebody swimming in somebody's swimming pool because, you know, the things have washed in and then when the water receded, this seal was left in the pool, but nobody knew what it was and we got the proper people there and they finally decided what it was. We had, uh, request one day for the uh, pickup of remains, cadaver. Well, it turns out that Hancock County was responsible for cadavers that passed as a result of the hurricane, and Harrison County was a result of people who passed from natural causes, or vice versa, I can't remember offhand. But Nobody knew what, what, what the cause of this particular death was. So it took a little while to get it sorted out to who was gonna retrieve this particular uh, course. Uh, that's the identity uh, County uh, food kitchen. And that's where we ate uh, our whole time there. Off and they cook three meals a day. And, you know, we said, no, we can cook it. Well, it ended up the head cook there knows my nephew. So we ate there every day. <laughs> it was well, good food. And, and the reason we did is because we ate, I told you there was a culinary program there at the boat, boat deck. But the chef, and they were feeding people, but the chef uh, was a Cajun from New Orleans. And we ate, the first meal we ate there, kind of like, burnt our mouth and our vocal cords and everything else. So so we said never again. And we went <laughs> we went to the Manatee County uh, kitchen to eat every day. Uh, you can't see the slide, but it says uh, Camp Welcome to Camp Katrina. And they put up a flag there at ha half mast. And again you see some of the response vehicle. That particular pickup is a sheriff's department truck. Next slide. That's the Army National Guard response. And let me tell you, about 90% of the vehicles they had had radios in them. And I'd be trying to talk or listen on my dual band radio and all of a sudden, <laughs> I mean, they wiped me out completely. The needle would peg, I thought it was gonna bend. You know, uh, and I, of course, couldn't do anything to do, to do about it. Just had to wait till the interference stopped and then continue whatever con conversation I was in with. But I, I mean to tell you, the National Guard, they were there and they were, in fact, heavily involved with the recovery. That's possible. You sure the dam, I take things to the dam, it was no handling. And they did. It was awesome. Yes, sir. Yeah. Were you? Did you deploy here? That, okay. Well, we thank you because you did a yeoman's job. Oh, tell them about that 
back and forth with the sergeant the request in the town. Oh, over the satellite, we, we had two satellite phones in, and I guess the lo one local radio station broadcast the numbers, although they were supposed to be used for, you know, people that were helping with the, with the disaster. But anyway, the DMAT um, group there called in and requested a helicopter for a burn patient. So I went to Sergeant Craig and I said, we, this DMAT team needs a helicopter for a burn patient. And this was in downtown Wayward, right? Yeah. And he says, you know, it takes a bunch of money to get one of those up and over and everything. I said, I understand, but they're asking for it. He said, we'll take care of it. Well, I got back out to the trailer and don't you know, they called back and said, no, never mind. We just, we fixed him up and we're going to send him by, by an ambulance. I said, okay. So I go back in and I tell Sergeant Craig, they said, cancel it. They're going to send me by ambulance. He said, great, great. So he said, we'll tell them not to go. Go back out to the trailer. Don't you know, they called back and said, he's downgrading. We need that. We need the helicopter. I said, you hold on. And I went and got Sergeant Craig and I brought him out. And I put him on the phone with the doctor, and I left it in their hands. I, I mean, I felt like a fool. I, I really did. But anyway, we got we got it handled. We got requests for propane, for example, for one of the feeding kitchens. And you know, 20-pound propane tank, 40-pound propane tank. What showed up was one of those trucks, you know, with the huge propane tank. So. That kind of reinforced with us the idea of, you know, when we're passing messages, we need to be as accurate as possible. I don't know how the, the message got from a 20 pound propane tank to a truck full. We also had a request at one of the pods for insulin. There was a lady that showed up with her daughter and her daughter had diabetes and needed insulin. So we said that, eventually I got that and I sent it to AMR. American medical response. They responded from Harrison County. They got to the pod, the lady and her daughter were gone. Now, I don't know where she got the insulin. Again, could the radio operator have been keeping an eye on those people? It, I would have been because who knows if the daughter had collapsed, right? But anyway, just one of the one of the in incidents. We had uh, a call on the radio from a young lady that needed to speak to the mayor. And it took Daisy several phone calls back and forth. We finally located the location of the mayor and we told her where to go. She was in the process of donating, donating three, five patrol vehicles for use by the Waveland Police Department. One of the things that this Votech school had was an auto mechanic. So they ended up painting it with the you know police markings for Hancock County. Because they ended up losing all of their all of their cars. Cars. You've got a list of other things that we talked about, but you can see it in there. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, hard to see, but in the center of the picture is a deployable uh, control tower that the Air Force brought in. Uh, I didn't bring the pictures of the airplanes in the hangar you know, the airplanes turn over and all that sort of stuff. You've seen those kind of pictures from hurricanes here locally. One of the funny things to me about that control tower was I walked into the EOC one morning around seven o'clock and there was this Air Force major in uniform about six, seven, 260. And he was standing over the security desk, you know, the ESF for security. And he said, I need security out there at the control tower, talking to a sheriff's deputy. Sheriff's deputy looked up and says, yeah, right. <laughs> well, this 260 pound major leaned over the table, <laughs> put his hands on that sheriff and he said, I want security. <laughs> and he got his security. Okay, next picture, please. Uh, you can't see it again very well, but those are sinks with mirrors, both sides of that trailer. So that's where the guys went out and shaved every day. Next slide. Need to take a shower. The, eight, the trailer is divided up into a women's side and a men's side. Necessary for people that 
didn't have the posh accommodations like we did in the motorhome, right? We had everything we needed. Of course, I had to go get gas at one point because I was running fairly low on gas and the generator needs gas in order to run, right? So Ricky Addington and I, uh, we scrounged, he had a couple of five gallon uh, gas containers. We scrounged another three. We went to the gasoline truck, which will be a slide in here, filled all five up. And I came in and poured them into my gasoline tank. So I'd, I'd have enough gasoline to keep the generator running. Next slide. Uh, TV, TV stations, as you might imagine. From Ohio, from Ohio that's right. Obviously trying to get all of the information they could on what was going on. Next slide. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers. I didn't ever find out exactly what they were doing, but they were there in force with a satellite, obviously, big one, and they were helping with the recovery is all I could say. But we had people respond. You know, I talk about our accommodations, but we had people respond that had no means of shelter, so they slept on the floor inside the building. We had people, hams now, respond that had some medical issues. Uh, if you're ever asked to respond, take into consideration your personal situation, right? Everybody that was asked to respond was asked to have their own shelter. And, you know, obviously if you have some medical conditions, you, you probably don't want to respond to a, an austere area that doesn't have electricity, doesn't have water, doesn't have anything that's working. Next slide. There's the gas truck. So you betcha we, we filled up at the gas truck again before we left. Uh, we were able to make it back to uh, Milton and we were able to fill it up when we got to Milton. And that was the end of our free gas. <laughs> so we had to go all the way back to Claremont uh, on, uh, on whatever we had. Of course, we filled up on our own dive. Next slide. Okay, I should have told you what the truck, the Budweiser truck rolled in, right? And everybody went, whoa, you know, looky here. Well, that's what was in the Budweiser truck. So we, we, got, we got snookered on that one. Pretty good. Next slide, please. I don't know how, oh, the, the, that's the psych tent, the shrinks. Uh, they asked everyone that was involved when they were leaving that they do an out processing with the uh, psychiatrist or psychiatric people there in the tent to make sure that everybody was in good mental sh shape when they left. We bypassed that because we didn't think we needed it and I don't think we needed it. So we didn't partake of that. Uh, next slide. I don't know how many of you have seen a John Deere tractor, but there's one hanging off a power line. Again, uh, a tribute to the, uh, the height of the uh, water and uh, the powerful of the power of the hurricane. Next slide. I know you don't want to see a whole lot of pictures of damage, but I got just a couple for you. That's the entrance to Walmart, downtown Waveland. Next slide. Uh, we build houses on stilts, right? Well, everything underneath got washed away, but so did most of the house. So again, that's kind of a testimony to the force of the storm surge and to the wind. Next slide. Uh, a foundation, that's all that's left. Next slide. Again, pictures of a house and the debris that's laying in the house. Next slide. Another steel stilts, but virtually the only thing re remaining from the house is everything that's steel. There's nothing left. Next slide. This particular walking bridge, St. Stanislaus College, the university or the campus is on the left. The water is right on the right of that uh, bridge. When the students would step down, they'd be on the beach. 
Now you can see all the debris that's, that's up on that screen there. So the water went at least that high, or at least the wind was blowing debris up that high. So it, it again, the, the force of this hurricane in this particular area was unbelievable. Uh, I know you all remember because the news, that's all they pretty much showed was New Orleans, right? After Katrina. But as far as destruction is concerned, I don't think there was as much destruction in New Orleans as there was in, in Hancock County. Now, New Orleans is a lot bigger, so I can't really make that as a true statement, but it was absolutely unbelievable uh, in Hancock County. Next slide, please. This is what we ended up calling Cell Point. This particular intersection was the only place in Waveland where cell phones would work. So people were going and coming all the time from that particular location once they, they heard about it. Next slide, please. Okay, we're on our way back. Got across the Pensacola Bay Bridge and that's a metal, what do we call it? PSP or something like that. You know, the, you see holes in the metal and you, we're going across there in a 27,000 pound motorhome, you kind of hunch your shoulders up and hold your feet up. Yeah. Okay. At least you weren't on a motorcycle because it follows the grooves. <laughs> yeah, you bet. <laughs> okay. Next slide. We ended up stopping in Destin. Uh, Fort Benning, Georgia has a recreation area there. And part of that is a little campground. And we were able to get a uh, spot. That's the motor home with our van in front of it. And, you know, we, we stayed there for about a week just to unwind. And while we were there, Daisy went to the uh, laundry there in the campground. And when she was doing her laundry and she started talking to a woman also doing her laundry. It turned out this woman was from Waveland. And when the hurricane was coming or was going to hit, they said, no problem. We got a motor home. And... When they lost electricity, they went out in the motorhome, started a generator, and whoopee. Well, after a couple of days, the motorhome ran out of gas, no generator, no air conditioning. Uh, I forget how many days, but four days. Four days. The, the debris was piled up to the, to the level of power lines. And it took four days before the Army could get the bulldozers in there and, and clear the roads. They weren't on a main artery. Yeah, so they, so they were able to drive out. And it turned out they drove from Waveland to, to this particular uh, campground here and they were staying there as well. And so it's amazing the stories that you hear. All right, I'm gonna stop for a second. All right, uh, this whole presentation so far has been about Hurricane Katrina. Well, we weren't home a month and Joe Bushel, remember the section emergency co corps there, called me and he said, can you go on another trip, another deployment? I said, where? He said, well, I got a call from uh, Palm Beach County, and I got a call from West Central Florida section manager, and they both want help. He said, I said, where do you want me to go? Us to go. He said, tell you what, the call from Palm Beach County came in first, so go down to Palm Beach. So off we went. Uh, next slide. Hurricane Wilma went through the southern part of the Florida Peninsula. Now the problem with Wilma was electricity, virtually wiped out. They didn't have much, they had some wind damage, but I'd say slight wind damage. Their big deal was electricity out. So people in high rise apartments, you know, had to walk down and walk up, you know, 20, 25 stories. And for the elderly people that got to be quite a chore, obviously. So we went, drove down to Palm Beach County uh, as, as is the case in all disasters like this, the governor waved the tolls on the turnpike, so we just whizzed down down there. We didn't have free gas on this trip, though, unfortunately. Next slide. We ended up at the Palm Beach uh, County EOC. Next slide. And we met with the uh, uh, EC for Palm Beach County, and they dispatched us to LaBelle, Florida, which is a town, what, 30 miles west of Palm Beach or so? Yeah, right around Lake Okeechobee. Next slide. Uh, that's a concrete power line pole snapped right in half. 
I don't know how that happened, but it surprised me. Next slide. We get out to the uh, middle school and we parked our motorhome behind the school. The Red Cross was running a shelter in the school. And we got there, the Red Cross lady that was in charge, she said, thank you for coming. However, I don't need your help right now. She said, our phones are working. And I said, okay, uh, we'll stand by in case you need us. Well, we were there for a couple of days. And finally I went to her and I said, look, uh, do you think anything's gonna happen that we, we, you need us? And she said, you know, not really. So we called back into the Palm Beach County EOC and said, what do you want us to do? So they called us back into the, the city of Palm Beach. Next slide, please. Uh, just shows you what a palm tree will do in a hurricane. Next slide. What we ended up doing was providing communication for a special needs shelter set up at the Palm Beach County Fairgrounds. And obviously they had people that needed uh, insulin, that needed oxygen, et cetera, et cetera, because they had electricity there. Next slide, please. We ended up uh, learning the telephones, working the fax machine, uh, taking messages out for people in the complex that needed, you know, they got phone calls from friends, relatives, or medical people that were calling in to see if they needed any supplies, et cetera, et cetera. There's a handheld radio there against the wall. That's a radio that connected us with the forest service. So if the pod called in again and needed resupply, Daisy called the pod people and said they need whatever at the pod. But tell them who you met out there. Yeah, Steve Cooley, anyone now working with Patrina. The same, the same forest service guy that was kind of in charge of their operation in Hancock County was in charge of the operation in Palm Beach County. So even though it, it wasn't, it, that's not directly related to, uh, next slide, please. Not directly related to Katrina, I thought I'd just add on those couple of slides to, to show you that it was completely different in terms of what we found and what we were doing and, and so on and so forth. One of the problems there, because there was no electricity, was getting gasoline, right? Gas pumps don't operate without electricity. And it was after that, some months, that I believe Governor Bush talked the legislature into passing legislation that all gas facilities had to have generators. I think the same thing occurred, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. So questions, anybody? I don't think what we experienced compares to what Mike experienced on his deployment over to uh, when Hurricane Maria hit. But I believe you've seen his information and you can make comparisons. Remember that this is what, 20 something years ago. And the technology then, and let me, let me put it this way, the, the sophistication, if you want to call us sophisticated, of Aries members and amateur radio operators wasn't near what it is today, as far as the training we get today, and so on and so forth. Now we had we had taken uh, the first couple of remember the ARRL had emergency communications courses that they they provided online. I think I had done three, and Daisy had done two. And we had done a couple of the ICS. Yeah, we had done a couple of the ICS courses, Which you know, we because, because we were able to understand what was going on in the EOC type operation. So, questions, comments? Yeah, we, we were actually there seven days. I said we were only needed to be there four, but we hung around just to help and we ended up helping, but when when they said okay you guys are done and we went back to the motorhome we actually drove around waveland and took tons of pictures we have a loose leaf notebook here full of pictures if you're interested in it and yeah he went with us and we drove around and actually when we got back it was like four o'clock in the afternoon and randy the, the 
they came and knocked on the door and wanted to know if I could do the night shift. And I told them, if you can't find anybody else, I'll do it. But you know, when you, you've got your adrenaline up and you know, okay, I'm gonna be here and 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 then I'm done. Once I knew I was done, I was flat. I could have done it if I had to, but luckily um, they got some more folks in and I, I didn't have to do it. You know, the satellite phones that were in there that Daisy mentioned, We once that phone number got out, it, it constantly was ringing with people want to know about their loved ones, the son, the brother, the father, et cetera. And, and one of the hands that worked with Daisy, she had, she had two, there were two hands in there, one and Daisy all the time that we were on duty. One of them, uh, he, he heard a number of those phone calls and he said, I got to leave. I can't take it. You know, all of the, the distressed phone calls that were coming in. So he was able to go outside for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and then gather himself and come back in. But uh, it, it's tough. It really is when you when you hear and see all that stuff going on. No smell like it. Did you get around the golf court? You had to pass the golf court. We did. We, we did. We did on I 10, but two years later, we came back through golf court. We could not tell where anything had been. And, I mean, and, it had been cleaned up, but it hadn't been rebuilt at all. And Waveland, too. Uh -huh. um, at, at that time, any of the because they had a, a law let you have a, a riverboat for gambling. Sure. Right. So their casinos were built as floating right. Right. and tied up at the dock. Well, Katrina drove them inland. Right. One was right on the middle of the highway, Highway 90. Yep. Oh, right. The Marines had come in and blow it up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it off the road. Yeah. Right. Um, but because the ship loading and unloading facilities were there, and they had some refrigerated warehouses around the dock to unload and offload. Frozen chicken, oh. all of that was inland along with yeah. dog food. Yeah. So when the hurricane comes, God exhales and everything goes sideways. Yeah. You had trucks in the water and boats on the road. Yeah, the yeah. DMAT group was set up in the Kmart parking lot, and evidently there was a had been a Chinese restaurant there. He called in one day the head the head of the DMAT group, this doctor, and he said, unless somebody gets out here today and cleans up this mess and gets this stuff out where the rats are all over the place. He said, we're packing up and leaving. So they got it cleaned up. <laughs> yeah, we, one of the, there were two companies that serviced a garbage pickup in Waveland area. And one of the owners was in there one day talking to Hootie, the EM director. And Daisy overheard him and he said, and the EM director said, Look, we've got garbage all over the place and it needs to be picked up. He said, Don't you worry about it, Hootie. I'll pick it up no matter where it is. You know, no matter, what company. No matter what company it is. So, guess what? <laughs> he left, he left me with a phone number. I got a call in about, I mean, one of the pods had overflowing garbage bins. I called him and he said, What company is it? And I said, I, You just told Hootie it didn't matter what company. He said, Well, I'm not picking it up if it's not ours. Uh, you talk to a talk to a politician and you and you say one thing and you get in the real world and you say something else. We're getting far afield. Yeah, not really. <laughs> We're getting far afield yeah. from what we handled. Okay. Again, any questions, any comments? Maybe this is up Miami. Yeah. Going down to Miami. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I was at homestead with a D Mat. Okay. That was my first duty station <laughs> years ago before Ed. I remember Keesler in 75, so recovering from uh, Camille. <laughs> Been there, done that, right. <laughs> okay. Appreciate, appreciate you having us. Appreciate you coming, visiting us. Well. It's been a while, but we've been here a couple of times. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've done that a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. So. Great presentation, Dad.
<laughs> Thank you. You got to do it next time. Uh, what? <laughs> oh God! Did you listen good? <laughs> yeah, I listened the entire time. Okay, I'm kidding you, Michael. I knew you were. I knew you were. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, bud. Is there any questions from? It was my pleasure. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me. Well, you're always you're always welcome to j come join us. <laughs> I do appreciate it, everybody, and I hope to see you guys soon. All right. Well, I guess this meeting is adjourned then, if there's no questions from the field. So, 73, y'all have a good evening. Appreciate you coming.